Come on, Merry Christmas, everybody. Come on, everybody at every location. Give Jesus your best right now. Come on. Let's... So good. I want to take a moment, look right into the camera, and I want to just greet everyone at Cortland and Corning and Binghamton. I want to tell you I love you. I care about you. I'm so glad that you're here for this Christmas experience I'm excited about what God's doing at every single location, and it is a beautiful thing. I also wanna greet everybody that's joining us online. You guys are awesome. I know if you get a chance to stop by, we're gonna make you feel right at home. Come on, give it up for everybody that's joining us online. Let them know we love them, we care about them. You guys are awesome. Well, I want, I want you to know today's message is entitled The Amazing Truth About Christmas. So go ahead, while, while uh, just turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter one. Matthew chapter one, we're gonna look at the Christmas story. While you're doing that, I, I know there's a bunch of kids in the house and I wanna tell you guys all about my uh, best Christmas gifts ever. I know some of you guys have dreams about the Christmas gifts and the things that you're looking forward to getting this year. And I had a couple amazing gifts throughout my time, so I'm gonna rank out a couple of the best gifts that I ever got. The first like number three on my list of all time, we, we got a snowmobile. It was a whole family gift, it was, and, and we just rode that snowmobile all over the place. It was probably from 1978, and if you, that's the year I was born, so it was probably about 20 years old by then. I'm not sure how old that snowmobile was, but it was old. But it was amazing. Like if you get a snowmobile and you're riding around in a snowmobile, that's a good gift, right? And then, and then the number two all-time best gift that I ever got, it was an amazing gift. It was actually a family gift, another family gift. Uh, we went to New York City as a family, and then we went to see the, the Christmas Spectacular at Radio City Music Hall. So we saw the Rockettes <laughs> kicking their legs up and doing that whole thing, and the toy soldiers all falling down. And it was just a, a beautiful time because we got to the Rockefeller Center, and we saw the tree saw the, the people, we got to ice skate and do all that kind of fun stuff. Just a beautiful time together as a family. And then my number one all-time favorite gift, all-time favorite gift of all time, it wasn't a Christmas gift though, just the best gift you could ever get. It was a BMX Huffy. It was a, it was a Huffy bicycle. And, and, and you can see that, that thing, it was, it was amazing because I saved up for that. I got some birthday money together for that. And, and, and I worked for that, and I bought this bike. And I'm telling you, this thing was my pride and joy. And I, like today, kids are kind of stuck in the house. Y'all don't have permission to free range. Like when I was growing up, we were free range kids. So your parents sent you outside on purpose. They were like, go away, go play. If you come back and you're alive, everything's good. And that's what I grew up in. So, so when you got a bike, a bike was access to the rest of the city. Like I got a bicycle, I was going downtown to the YMCA. We rode our bikes one day to the mall. Like I was in fourth grade, right? We went and snuck into a PG-13 movie. I watched Ghostbusters. It was, it was amazing. Cause a bicycle, man, you got to go anywhere. And this was a, this had gold rims had gold handlebars, it had, it had this sweet cushion in case you fell off the, the seat, just in case, like that was gonna help you. But it was there, right? It was, this thing was, this was, I'm telling you, it was my pride and joy. And one day, my sister, my older sister, she decided, I have no idea why, she decided to take my bicycle and go for a ride with it. Now, I don't know about you, but no one should touch another person's bike, right? There should be permission granted. There should be all kinds of instructions given about how to put the kickstand down, about how to, this, all of these things have to happen. Well, my sister didn't get any permission. She put her hands on my bicycle, and then she took it down the street, and apparently they were having some kind of jumping thing. So you know how that, that goes. When you have a, a neighborhood ramp. It's about as sketchy a ramp as you're ever going to get, right? That's a very sketchy ramp. And my sister tried to ride my bike over this jump, 
And I don't know if it was too high or what she did wrong, but when she landed, it split the frame in half. <laughs> high quality. <laughs> so it was a bike that a four, fourth grader could afford, right? So, so my sister comes back to the house. I'll never forget, I was on the back porch. She comes around the corner. She is crying. She is bleeding. But her, the bike was torn in two. And, and I gotta tell you, I started crying. But I was not crying for my sister. I was crying because my sweet chariot was broken in half. And, and I was literally, I was like a fourth grader. My heart was broken. I was so mad at my sister. I wanted my sister to pay for that bike. Like it wasn't enough that she got hurt. She stole my bike and then broke it. And I wanted justice. I wanted justice for that broken bike. Well, let's turn in our Bibles now. I, I, this message today is entitled, the, What's the, the Most Amazing Truth About Christmas? And so, so looking in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to read through the Christmas story. And it starts in verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now that's quite a surprise. You want to talk about a Christmas present, (laughs) right? You're like, like, here's a Christmas present. You're pregnant. Some of the girls at Two, Two Rivers know about that right now. Some of the guys also know about that. Like, you're experiencing the joy of pregnancy. So I'm not quite sure how the next verse took place, but because Joseph discovers now that his betrothed, the, the girl that he's engaged to, is pregnant. And there's another Christmas present, right? How, how many guys would be like super excited? Yes! The girl I'm engaged to that I've never been with. All the adults know what I'm talking about. It's totally pregnant. So good. So here's Joseph's thing, verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, they call her, they're not yet married, but the way betrothal worked was that they could be called husband. It was a contract that actually took place. And so he was preparing in, in this whole thing. It was a pretty serious business. Even though they were engaged, they, they referenced, he's referenced maybe past tense, but there's a tight connection at this point. Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Verse 20, but after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is, everybody together, from the Holy Spirit. So verse 21, she'll give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus has a name, and the name Jesus actually has some meaning to it. Like, he wasn't to be named anything random. The angel gave Joseph instructions that Jesus was gonna have his name because it means redeemer. He's going to save his people from their sins. Now, verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. What did the Lord say in verse 23? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, everyone with me, God with us. So so here's the amazing truth about Christmas. This whole thing, like that whole passage, it's like, oh, it's neat. Mary got pregnant. Joseph kept her. Everything kind of works out. It's kind of like, oh, cool, we get this whole Christmas thing. But, but, but there's something that we miss in the middle of all that. There's this amazing truth that we're sitting right on as we talk about Christmas every single year. And the amazing truth is that God did not send someone to redeem us. He came himself. Like, this is amazing that 
God himself became a man, and that man was the savior of the world. This idea that Jesus was fully God and fully man is just mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-boggling. God didn't send just anyone. And I want us to discover this idea of redemption. Because, because God had to come. I want us to discover this amazing truth about Christmas that, that, that not anyone could have redeemed us. It had to have been the God-man. That only the God-man could redeem us. And so, so why did our sin require God to redeem us? So here's, here's the way I want to do that. I have, I have a toy, this amazing toy that came from my house, and then I have a hammer. Now, hammers are awesome. How many people like hammers? Yeah, right? Like, now, now, who thinks it's fun to smash things? Like a lot of hands going up, a lot of everybody, yeah, like every guy put his hands up just now. Some of you didn't. I'm going to talk to you later. So, so who wants to smash something right now? Right, like there's a few, there's less people because that, that might involve, he might actually bring me up and I actually be on stage and I don't know if I'm gonna do that right. Like less hands went up, I know. So, so here's what's gonna happen. We all like the idea, like I was born, I like to smash things, just in me. I'm built that way, let's crush some stuff. Let's blow things up, let's see explosions happen. If we can't do it actually, let's do it on video games. There's some, I know there's some kids right now that are waiting. Give me, give me that video game. We're going we're to blow some things up this year. Come on, Mom. Your greatest gift of all time. You're waiting for it. And, and so here's, here's what we do. We, we like to smash things. And what we imagine will be happening when we smash something is that we could do it without consequence. Like how great would it be that we could just smash stuff without consequence? And that's, that's how we want to live. In fact, we do that with our lives. Like if I swing the hammer, what's going to happen? Something's gonna break, right? If I hit something with it, this is gonna be collision. So, so let's, I'm gonna smash some stuff. All right, so this problem. I broke this. I, I, didn't, I didn't wanna break it. I wasn't thinking about that it would actually break when I smashed it, because I smashed it. But here's what we do. We break stuff because in our life, we, we wanna live any way we want to. Right, we wanna live without consequence. I wanna live without consequence. I, most people that I know wanna live cons without consequence. Most kids that I know wanna live without consequence. I, I believe that I can lie without consequence. I can cheat without consequence. I, I'll do everything in my power to cheat and never get caught, and if I don't get caught, no one will know, and it'll be okay. I, I wanna be able to covet and I wanna desire things that don't belong to me. I wanna, I wanna desire other people's things and think that's not gonna be a problem. I think I can hurt people and get away with it. It's not, no consequence. I can be jealous. All of these things, though, do damage. They do damage to us and they do damage to the people around us. They break us a little bit. And, and so... So every time something like that happens, things get broken a little bit more. So it's silly to think that I can swing the hammer without any consequences. Now, here's the reality of this. This toy did not belong to me. This toy belonged to somebody else. In fact, it was my son's toy. So now, what do I need to do to make this right for my son? His name is Nicholas. What do I need to do to make this right? There's something that has to happen for justice to take place. And, and here's, what it has to, here's what we need to do. We need to redeem this. This needs to be redeemed. I want to tell you what redeem means. The first thing redeem means, it means to purchase. It means to purchase. So, so here's what could happen. In order for justice to happen for my son Nicholas... This, I could buy him another one of these. Now, could I buy him one that's not as good as this one and have it be just? Why won't anyone tell, so the answer to that is no, right? Why won't anyone tell insurance companies that? 
right? Like, like when you, everyone knows this, you've experienced this, if you've ever had an accident and your insurance company tries to tell you that they're gonna get you a replacement vehicle. They always try to get you a vehicle that's not as good as the vehicle that you had. You're like, I had the EX model, you're trying to give me the LX. They're like, yeah, but it's similar mileage. No, no, I want the same thing or better. That's what's just, right? So, so I need to purchase something as good or better. The second thing that happens when we redeem something, it means to release from consequences. Everybody say release. release. See now, there's this transaction that took place between my son and I, he may not know it yet, but I've destroyed one of his things. So I've encroached on a relationship. And, and we actually have a name for this. We have another word for this besides redeem, to release from consequences. That word is forgiveness. See, in order to redeem something, someone has to be forgiven. So what if, what if somebody right now just said, hey, Pastor Will, I forgive you for breaking that. It's totally fine. Does that square up the account for Nicholas? See, forgiveness has to come from the right destination, the person who's been offended, the person who's been wrong, the person who there is a balance that's been taken away from them needs to be restored. So in order for forgiveness to take place, something has to be purchased. There, there has to be a transaction that takes place in order for forgiveness to take place. Forgiveness cannot just be given on its own because justice has not been met. And so, so finally, if we were gonna redeem this, we would either need to repair it or to restore it. Like you, you may not have to purchase it, but you'd have to make this brand new in order for my son to be pleased with it again. And that's why God alone is the only one who could come to redeem us. Because when we sinned, when we did whatever we wanted to do, when every one of us, the Bible says every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, only God himself could pay for, could purchase us, because for there to be an equal transaction, there has to be something that is of equal or greater value to take its place. And because every time we sin, we sin morally, there has to be perfect, a perfect moral payment. And the only one that could do that is a sinless person. And the only one who could ever live a sinless life is the God-man, Jesus Christ. In order to release us from consequences, somebody had to pay for that. And then the, the transaction that we had when we sin, we sin against each other, but ultimately we sin against God. We are all created in God's image, and so that when we sin, we distort the image of God, and so all of our sin can only be paid for by the one whom we have sinned against in order to release us from the consequences. And, and God alone is the only one who can restore that which is broken. God alone is the only one who can repair and make new that which has been destroyed. Man, in and of ourselves, cannot accomplish that. Here's what 1 Peter 2.24 says. I'm gonna have the team come back. We're gonna go ahead and wrap up right here. It says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. You know what this is saying? This is saying that our Redeemer, bore our sins. He didn't bear his sins, but he took our place on the cross so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. And this is amazing. By his wounds, you have been healed. So, so God didn't send someone to redeem us. He came himself. Here's, here's what this all boils down to. We broke what he made, then he paid for it. That's what the most amazing thing is about Christmas. That God 
traded his life. He became just like us. And then the thing that we, we did, we offended against him. He paid for our offense. So here's what I hope. I hope at every location, in Binghamton, in Cortland, in Corning, I, I just hope you hear this in your heart. You do not have to pay for, you don't have to fix, you don't have to run from your brokenness. Jesus came to do that for us. The, the greatest gift, what I should have given you in my list of great gifts that I've ever received, the greatest gift truly is Jesus. When my sister broke my bike, if I had it my way, I would have made my sister pay for that bike. Like I absolutely, she's gonna pay for my bike. I don't care what happened to her. I want my stuff restored. I want my stuff back. I want my thing taken care of because that's what justice would be. If the person who offended me would fix it. And you know what happened in that instance? I've got a good dad and my dad paid to redeem the bike that my sister broke. He got that bike fixed up and I got that bike back and I was back in town doing my thing. But in the same way, we've got a good father who paid to redeem the lives that we have broken. So the good news for us is that you can receive the redemption that Jesus offers by admitting that you've sinned and accepting with gratitude that Jesus paid for your sins. Let's have every head bow and every eye closed. Just really simply, you have in, in your seat, you don't have to close your eyes just yet, you, you have in your seat the little respond card. And at the top of that it says, I commit to follow Christ. If you're here and, and you know that you're ready for that transaction to take place in your life. You're ready to stop trying to earn it, trying to fix it. You're gonna let what Jesus did on the cross, what we read in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. I want for you to experience the healing that comes from God alone. And the way that happens, if you want that, I just want you to check that you're either recommitting your life to Christ or you're committing that, your life to Christ. And then I, I want us to all pray a very simple prayer together, just with every head bowed and every eye closed. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. I give you my life, all of my brokenness, all of my sin. I ask you to forgive me and restore me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.